Well, you know, Christmas, man, it, it, it's funny. Have you ever noticed, like, this time of year, it's what I call the Christmas effect. Even mean people. <laughs> how do you know I'm not talking about y'all? No. no, but even mean people are nice at Christmas. Or, or at least they act nice. I, I think it's... I think sometimes there's a fabricated joy that comes along with the Christmas season. It's like the Christmas season makes us think that we have to act like we've got a perfect life. It's kind of like a a Hallmark movie. Any any of you seen A Perfect Christmas? That's A Perfect Christmas. And it's about two newlyweds, Steve and Cynthia. They're in the middle. They're celebrating their first Christmas together. And it just looks So incredibly perfect, whatever that means. But I wonder if we knew what they were really thinking if we would think it's so perfect. See, I think Steve is thinking, I can't stand the sight of Cynthia's nagging mother. And Cynthia, I think she's thinking, what kind of man wears a scarf and skinny jeans to a Christmas party? (laughs) I don't know, Jordan. I'm just kidding. He's going to be preaching, I think, in a few weeks. uh, I don't know, sometime in the near future, and he's going to get me back, so I better watch it. But I think if we're honest, we we feel a little bit more like this picture. Like a pig in captivity on the way to a hog roast. Maybe if we could just be honest today and be real. Maybe some of us would admit that we're kind of like that pig. We feel like we're in a, in a tough spot. Maybe we, we feel like we're in the midst of trouble. We're in week three of our series. We're calling Awaken the Wonder. Isaiah 55, or 50, uh, sorry, 45, 3, God says, I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places. Now that's the prophet Isaiah talking to King Cyrus, but I think there's application for us as well. I think God wants to awaken, to bring back to life some of the things we were talking, we were just singing about it. I think he wants to to reveal some, some hidden treasure. But here's the tough part. The tough part is that the path to revealing that treasure involves trouble. Now, I know that doesn't jive with the Christmas season, but... That's God's plan, oftentimes, to bring, to unearth treasure. Tr- trouble's like, a, like an excavator. It, it unearths one scoop at a time the very treasure that is buried beneath. One troubling scoop at a time. God's unearthing the real treasure. Today I don't want to talk about a perfect Christmas. Instead, I want to talk about the thing we hide. I want to talk about what doesn't show up on your post, your social media post. I I want to talk about what wasn't included in your Christmas cards that you sent out this year to all your family. I want to talk about what you won't talk about when you're at work around the cooler talking about different stuff. I want to talk about the treasure of trouble. Look at your neighbor and say, there's, there's treasure in your trouble. There's treasure in your trouble. I want to talk about the treasure of trouble. Because the Christmas story is, is full of hope, right? You've heard that message. And that's a good message. And that's a message we need to hear. But, but, the, but the Christmas story is also full of trouble. They're inseparable. You see, God, we're going to look at Luke chapter 1, we're going to see God awaken the wonder of a teenage girl. And through this teenage girl, he would awaken the wonder of the world. How would he do it? In part, through trouble. Mary's about to figure out the treasure of trouble. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. 
the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Whew, take that to the bank today. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Lord, thank you that you are doing great things. You are unearthing things that need to be unearthed. We thank you for that process, even though it involves some trouble. God, we welcome it because we know that there's a greater good that's being accomplished. Help us see that from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So Mary had a perfect life, had everything going. Here she's a, probably around 15 years of age. She, she was betrothed. She was engaged. You know, she was, everything was perfect. She had a, a house picked out in Marley Park. She was engaged to a hot Jewish boy. Uh, you know, the wedding in venue, that whole venue up in, in, in Flagstaff, already picked out bridesmaid dresses, already ordered. And all of a sudden, the angel of God shows up and says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled. Now, did you catch the correlation? Highly favored. Next sentence, greatly troubled. Treasure, trouble. There is an inseparable connection between the unearthing of treasure and the ensuing inevitability of trouble. That's the way God works. So now she's got to walk around Nazareth explaining the bump. And the people are gossiping. Is she a fornicator because she had premarital sex? Or is she an adulterer because she cheated on her husband? Which one was it? Right? And do you ever feel like you're going through life and you're just, you know, things are going great and God just sticks out his foot and trips you up? Or is it just me? Maybe he just does that to me. He trips us. But why? Student of the Bible, why? Why does he trip us? God trips us to equip us. He's not tripping you just so you fall flat on your face, unless that's what it requires to wake us up, right? But he trips us to, in fact, equip us. Sarah was tripped up with inf infertility to produce stability. Moses was tripped up by a guy named Pharaoh who would produce a fighter in Moses. Job, he was tripped up by tragedy would produce trust. David was tripped up by a selfish king named Saul to produce a selfless king named David. Paul was tripped up by a disaster. A disaster in Damascus. I know no one can relate because you've never experienced a disaster, but that disaster would take him from, from being a hater of Christians to a hero of the faith. He wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament, maybe 14 if you count Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. My point is, God sends a disaster in Damascus and literally trips Paul up with blindness. He falls to the ground, if you remember the story in Acts 9, to, to awaken him. Anybody going through a Damascus season? Anybody? Could you be honest? Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Appreciate that. God doesn't waste the Damascus experience. And I like you. You can sit up front all day, girl. Be freed up in the spirit to, to say amen and to be lively up in this church. I like that. God likes that. Here's the thing. Here's what God, I'm, here's what God spoke to me. He said, John, sometimes I send you a Damascus to Damask us. Whew. Hit me. Whew. 
I mean, he was, he was carrying, I mean, what, what, what was Paul carrying into, into Damascus? He was ca- carrying into this false image, this false label. I'm a persecutor of Christians. Y'all better be ready with me because he didn't believe in the Christ. He thought Christ was a phony. And so he's going to go persecute Christians. He was carrying the wrong label. And, he, and, and God, through that Damascus experience, would take him from a persecutor to a planter. He planted most of the churches all throughout the ancient world. I wonder what, he's, what we're carrying. Someone said the heaviest burden we carry are the thoughts in our head. The thoughts of what we think of ourselves. The devil doesn't have to label us because we already labeled ourselves. We already limited ourselves with our label. The devil doesn't have to. We talk ourselves out of the own blessing and out of our destiny. We, we, we do the work for him. And I think sometimes God wants to demask us. He wants to, to, to wake us up. I remember, I got so many stories I could tell you in college, man. Cindy knew me, and we started dating in college, and she can verify all this. But I was just, I was into myself and, and trying to, you know, look a certain way and act a certain way and struggling with pride. And uh, God has a way of demasking us. In a good way, right? And, and I remember one time, so I, I, I played basketball on the basketball team, and, and so I was kind of connected with the athletic department. Well, I ended up getting a part-time job working for s- some sweet old ladies in the athletic department. And, uh, you know, one, one day that we had an event, and they had some ca- a bunch of cash that they wanted to take to the bank, and so they, they wanted me to come with me, you know, because, you know, I'm a, a strapping young lad that would, you know, protect them in the event of some sort of altercation. And so... I, I, I'm with them, I, we go there, and, and we, we drop it off at, at the uh, bank depository. If, if, before there was an ATM, there were these, remember those things? The, the, they're depositories. Well, so we drop off the cash in the depository, we, we come back, and there was uh, Mark Gooden. Mark Gooden, he was like the star of our basketball team. He's like, he sees me walk in with these sweet old ladies, he's like, what y'all doing? Oh, I said, we, ju- we just made a, a, a deposit in, the, uh, in this suppository. His face looks at me. Yeah, yeah, no, it was a big one. We made a big, big, big deposit. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. I thought it was called a suppository. I didn't know. <laughs> and, and, and just a note to, to those of you who are just catching up with me, that's something you don't want to make a, a deposit to. You'd rather make a withdrawal, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but God has his ways of demasking us. Amen. Or is he just do it to me? Oh, I'm sure it's just me. I think a lot of us, we need God to trip us up because we're so enamored with other people's treasure. I met, I met some guy, me, me and actually another guy from this church met, met up with another guy who doesn't go to this church, but was going through a rough season. He had, he had been to a church, and he worked at this church for, for a year. And he was, it was quite evident that he, he, he felt like a failure because he, he, he felt like they ended up letting him go. And he felt like I just wasn't what they needed me to be. You know, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried. And, you know, and then he's like, well, but, you know, I, I've been reading a lot about, you know, David and trying to heal and heal from this church wound and blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, have you ever read that part about David in 1 Samuel 17? You know the part where, where King Saul, right before he, he, he goes out and fights Goliath, when King Saul's like, uh, you can use my armor. Here you go. Put this on. And so he puts on the armor, and he's like, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. And in fact, it says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 39, I, he's, David says, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Here's what I'm saying. I told him this, and I want to tell you this. Don't fight your battle wearing Saul's armor. God has given you a specific armor. Mike P., a slightly larger armor, but an armor nonetheless. It's because he's strong. God's given us a unique armament. Like, wear your own armor. Be who God's called you to be. Yes, serve under a church and, and, and respect the authority placed over. That's Romans 13. But, but listen, God made you you. 
And I think sometimes we, we're too busy trying to be somebody else, chasing somebody else's treasure. And God says, I got a specific armor for you. Mary, Mary, you got the, you got the mother of God armor. Whew. That's a cool armor. But you got yours too. I got mine. I have a mentor that I meet with from a very large church. He planted a great successful church. He's a great man of God, super successful. We were meeting for lunch and, and he told me something about, he, he mentioned something about like how I, I mentioned people by name. And he's like, he's, I don't know if that's a good thing to do because, you know, that kind of feels like small church. And, and I said, you know, but our values are family, authenticity and mission. And family, you know people's name and you interact. And here's the point. He, he, I love and respect and, and, and glean so much from all the mentors that I meet with. But I ain't trying to be somebody else. God has a specific plan for the gathering, right? And a specific plan for you and a spe specific plan for me. And God wants to unearth that. But he can't unearth it if you're busy trying to fit into somebody else's armor. Amen? Amen. There's treasure in, in, in our, our trouble. So, second point. Your trouble magnifies your witness. Your trouble magnifies your witness. What, what does the angel say? He will be great. I'm talking about baby Jesus. He will be great. True or false? Was he great? He was great. The truth is he always was great because we have to handle, when we talk about theology, we want to rightly divide the word. There was never a... a either the pre-incarnate Christ before he took on flesh or the post-resurrection Christ, there was never a time, never will be a time in history where he was not great, where he ceased to exist or ceased to be great. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. He always was. He always will be. So he always was great. But he will be great, meaning that, like, it's going to take us a little while in our humanity to recognize his greatness. That's why it says in Luke chapter 2, God grew in favor of God and of man. That process was called the incarnation of Christ. He left heaven, the doctrine of incarnation. He left heaven. He had it made. He had things perfect. Up. He left and came and dwelt among us. Do you know that Christianity is the only religion in which the deity reaches down to humanity? Every other religion is an attempt by humanity to reach up to the deity. God flipped the script and said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to endure trouble to set an example for my people of what I can do through the path of suffering. But the problem is we've got to endure the trouble to, to unearth the treasure. Because if we whine and kick and scream, we can miss out on God, what God wants to unearth. You ever heard about the lost years? I want to preach about the lost years. The lost years of Jesus? No, no one talks about the lost years. Why? Because they're lost, because they're not in the Bible. From age 12... Remember, they lost him in the temple to age 30 when he began his ministry. Whoosh. What happened? I don't know. We don't know what happened. That's why they call them theologians. We call that the lost years. I think some really cool stuff happened in those lost years. I can't wait to get to heaven and ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, tell me about the lost years. You know? And, and, and I think, I mean, we can, put some, we can put some of the puzzle together. We know from John 7 verse 5, that the brothers, they didn't believe in Jesus. And we know we had at least four brothers, two sisters. And, and, and so the brothers didn't believe in him that he was the Messiah until after the resurrection. And so could you imagine the conversations and the hazing that went on, putting Jesus in a wedgie, you know? <laughs> Mom, he's saying he's God again. He said he's going to walk on water. Stop, Jesus. God. <laughs> Think about a God who, who would willingly endure emotions, suffering, fatigue, pain. He's fully God. But took on humanity. While being fully God, took on humanity. Meaning he would suffer like we suffer. Someone said that pain is God's megaphone to rouse the deaf world. C.S. Lewis. He used pain. He modeled that for us. And his trouble allowed his witness to be magnified. Here's the proof. 
Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Is it easier to follow a God that lived it out? Yes. You, you remember uh, Pastor Matt. You guys, some of you guys know Pastor Matt. He, he and I used to go to the same gym together, and we would see this, this, um, this, this trainer who would, this really big dude, and he's sitting there eating Oreos while he's training. And it always bothered us because we're like, like who's going to, why would you do that? You're not setting the, ex-. he set the example. Jesus ain't over in the corner eating Oreos. He's on the cross suffering, dying, being an example for his people. It's kind of follow a leader like that. Amen. Our trouble magnifies our witness if we let it. What you're walking through right now can be the greatest witness if we let it. The problem is we omit our trouble. I need, I need some help illustrating this. Leon, with that. Nicolette, come up with him. Will you come up with him? Oh, come on. Oh, come on, come on. I mean... You, you can't be wearing that cardigan and looking like Mr. Rogers and I'm not going to say anything. Come on up here. <laughs> Come on up here. We got a mic. So here, I need some help. Because we, 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 uh, we omit the best part of our story. Leon, so I need your help. No, no, both of you. Both of you. Can, you, can any of you sing? Can you sing? No. no. Absolutely not. Okay, this isn't, re- we don't rehearse this stuff, okay? You can't say you're an authentic church and they rehearse this stuff. So they didn't know they were going to be called upon. Uh, so you can't sing? Not That's either. even better. <laughs> That's going to work out great. So the thing is, like, Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Old people remember the song? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Bop, bop. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. All right, so I'm not going to make you sing that song. But you can, you can at least h- h- sing the rejoice part. Rejoice! Rejoice. Oh, no, come on. <laughs> no, and no, no, I need a choir. No, you ain't getting off the hook, Nicolette. Okay, so just hold the mic in the middle. And, and, and anytime I go like this, I need you, because that's the typical Christian response. Right? We're walking through some sort of trouble. And, you know, we read Bible verses and think we got to rejoice. So anytime I do this, anytime I see that, that means you, you just say, Rejoice! Can you sing it on that key? No. <laughs> la, 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 la. Try it. You can do it off the blower. I'll try the rejoice part. La, 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 la. La for you. La for you. Okay. <laughs> All right, ready? <laughs> so, 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 here we go. Ready? You're walking through trouble. Rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's good. Hey, what's that over there? Rejoice. Oh, that is good. Okay, okay, you ready? Anytime the hand goes up. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. This is what we do. We're Christians. We're programmed to always rejoice in the midst of suffering, right? And that's good. That's good. But we omit the best part of our story. We give people, when they ask us at work, you work at Ford, right? Yep. Yeah, he, he, he runs a, a team at Ford. And when you work at Ford and people ask, how are you doing? Oftentimes, rejoice. <laughs> oh, it's good. My life is great. Right? And we omit the best part of us. We give people what I call a time-elapsed testimony. Ooh, time-elapsed. What, what do I mean? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Yeah, you was lost for like 20 years. And you left that, that's the part that people can relate to. Because when you're talking to lost people, they're in that lost season. And if you don't, if you don't bring up your lost season, they think you're squeaky clean and can't relate to them. What God did was in the lost season. And we omit that because we're too busy. Rejoice. And, 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 and we should rejoice. We, amen. But we rejoice in the midst of it all. Like, so, so stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. What, what, what has a better response? Here's, here, here, here's, here's, an, here's an, a response of omission. Ask me how I'm doing. How are you doing today? In the microphone. How are you doing today? Man, Leon, I'm glad you asked, man. <laughs> Things are great. 
Whoo! I mean, my wife, we're good. We, we haven't fought in like, I don't know, like all year. And, and the, kids, the kids are doing great. They're getting great grades. I mean, like they're like little angels. They behave. They respect. And, uh, man, uh, my job, whew, get, probably be getting a raise, right? You know what I'm saying? Okay, that's, that's omission. Now ask me again. How are you doing today? How am I doing today? Here's, this, is, this is not omission. This is admission. Different. Man, uh, whew. Uh, my wife went in for uh, a biopsy. I don't, get, I don't get the news back till, till next week. And this is, it didn't really happen. You know, relax, y'all. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, I went in my, my, my son's room and I, I found some, some marijuana. I'm kind of, kind of worried about that, you know. Um, and honestly, man, I, I just found out at work they're, they're downsizing. And I'm not sure if I'm going to have a job after Christmas, but I don't want to tell my wife, man, because, you know, I don't want to ruin her Christmas. But you know what? She, Leon, I, I read something. I, I was reading a Christmas story. Check this out. I was reading it, and, and it said that no promise from God will ever fail. And so, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm clinging to that, you know? So, man, pray for me because, like, I'm just clinging to that promise because I know God's in control. I know he's going to make a way. You tell me which one is more effective. The, the response of, of omission or admission? What carries more weight? And so here, here's, here's what I want to do. I don't know what you're walking through. I have no idea. But is your life perfect? No. Is your life perfect? Not at all. Okay, so here's what God says. Here's, here's, what, here's what I want to do. First Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. You know what that was? That was written to Asia Minor, the, 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 the Christians in Asia Minor. They were going through hell. They were going through suffering. They were going through trouble. And what he's saying is, look, your witness means most when it's hardest to give. And here's what I want to say. Don't. Bury your treasure beneath your trouble. We do it all the time. We bury it. Oh, man, we whine, we complain. And I know I'm not minimizing what you're going through. I'm just maximizing what God wants to do through it if we let it. And so here's what, I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what your situation is. But I want you to give God praise in the midst of whatever. Because I know there's some sort of struggle, right? We all have struggles. You've got some sort of struggle, I'm sure, too, Nicolette. It's life. So... Always be prepared to give an answer, right? So it doesn't have to be theological. It doesn't have to be something, uh, you know, I wonder what they're going to think. I don't care what they think. Like, how can you be hopeful when you're going through a tough time? What is it? I'm asking you, like, what, what is it in you that can, can still be hopeful when hell is breaking loose in your life? What is it? And Nicole, may, may, maybe you have something. Uh, I think for me is um, I just know life is full of peaks and valleys. And yeah. so um, there's been times where it's been a lot harder than things are now. Yeah. And I didn't know how things were going to work out, and they did. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm all, I, I know things are, this is not the end. I know this yeah. is not the end, and everything's going to get better. But I know there's going to be peaks and valleys. Amen. And I'm a strong guy, so I'm ready for them. Amen. Amen. Nicolette, how can you have hope in going through a tough time? How? Um, I can have hope because I know, I, I know what God's brought me through before. So I'm going through a bunch of health things, but... I know every time I've had huge issues in life, God's got me through it, so he's going to get me through this too. Amen. Give him a hand. Come on. Nice job, guys. Oh, woo. Come on. That's the unscripted word of God spoken through God's people via the Holy Spirit. Someone needed to hear that today. Someone's watching online. You need to hear that. Whew. God is at work. And, and, and what, what happens is, is th this is what happens. Take a little magnifying glass and your trouble, it just, it can magnify your value to other people. It can magnify your witness if we let it. Anybody, uh, anybody know Leonardo da Vinci's most famous painting in the 18th and 19th century? Does anybody know? In that time period, what his most famous painting was recognized around the world. Anybody know? Huh? 
Go ahead, don't, don't, don't worry. I won't make fun if you're wrong. Oh, someone, someone said the, the Mona Lisa. That's what, everyone, that's what most people think. No, no, no. That's, that's Michelangelo. But thanks for playing. No, uh, this is why no one speaks up because I'm so mean. No, it was the Last Supper. During the 18th and 19th century, his most famous and recognized painting was the Last Supper. But that all changed. August 22nd of 1911. You see, a guy at the Louvre Museum in Paris, France, a guy would hide on a Sunday night in the closet. Monday morning, he came out of that closet, grabbed the Mona Lisa, and walked out of the Louvre Museum. 28 hours before anybody noticed that painting was gone. Why? Because it was just the Mona Lisa. It wasn't the Last Supper. It wasn't highly sought after. 28 days until they found it and got it back. What's interesting is that a painting that lived in bathrooms, literally it was in a king's bathroom in Mona Lisa, it was actually discolored because of the steam of the king's bathroom. Uh, a painting that lived in obscure places, government buildings, bathrooms, bedrooms, it became the most famous and worth, worthy painting in history. $860 million in worth. What happened? Did the painting change magically? No, didn't change over the 400 years. What happened is it ran into some trouble. Trouble revealed the treasure that it always was. So too it is with you and with me in the Christian life. God wants to do some unearthing of some treasure, but it requires some trouble. That's the treasure of trouble. I want to bring my wife up here, Cindy. I want to bring uh, Pastor Michael and, and uh, Pastor Jordan. I want to, I want to, we're going to pray because here's what we got coming. We've got a whole bunch of Mona Lisa's coming to the park next week. A whole bunch of hidden treasure, people that they don't know their worth, they don't know their value, they don't know what's on the inside. They don't see themselves like God sees them. And I believe God's going to do some unearthing. <laughs> I believe there's some treasures, some Mona Lisa's that are going to be revealed. And we went through a lot of trouble, didn't we? I mean, we went through some trouble. You went through some trouble to make this happen. In fact, I can put a value to that trouble, just over $74,000 worth of trouble. And that's not including the check that someone gave me today for $7,500, it's in my pocket right now, don't forget. See, that's a lot of trouble. How many people signed up, Michael? 200 230. 230 people signed up to, to come out and work. That's a lot of trouble. And that's a lot of trouble. We have people that are making care packs and going out and distributing them to their neighbors. They call themselves the God Squad, and they're going out and doing that, sharing about this event. That's a lot of trouble. But God's going to use it to reveal some treasure. And that treasure... treasure's the one. I don't know who that one is, but you're going to meet the one. <laughs> you're going to see those hands come up, and you're going to see that's the one. That's the, you're the one I've been praying for, sweet daughter of God, son of God. Man, I've, been, I've never met you, but he did, and I met you through him in faith. 
I saw you before I ever saw you. You were the one. You're going to meet him. You're going to meet him on the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And so you know what I want to do right now? I, I, want, I, want, to, uh, I want to pray. We're gonna, I'm ask, asking uh, Pastor Jordan just to cover us in prayer. Cover that event in prayer. We're standing together, unified as a staff, unified as a team, unified as a church, and saying, the one is coming. That treasure is coming. It's going to cause some trouble. We're going to be tired. And by the time that whole event's over, we're going to be dog tired, especially Michael, because he's doing all the operations for this. But, but we're going to be tired with a purpose, realizing that God unearthed the one, the treasure in the one through broken vessels like us. Amen. Let's pray. And, but, but as I pray, you pray for that, that one you're inviting. God, we love you. And God, I, I just stand in awe that we get to do this. Um, that God is going to get to. We, we get to go out into the park for the one. And so, Father, I pray for every volunteer. I pray for every invite. I pray for every person going out and, and sacrificing. May God, you bless them. May God, you keep us safe. And, and Father, I pray for those that are giving of themselves. That God, they laugh a lot this week. May God, it'll be the most fun week they've ever had serving other people. And God, we pray for the one that we're going to invite, whether it's the one single parent. Maybe it's, it's that one family down the street that we know is a, that one family we know might not make it. That, that one marriage that's crumbling. God, that one skeptic. God, that one person that ran decades ago, I pray they come to the park and they see you. That God, from the people in the parking lot to God, to the time they walk through the snow and they sit in the seat, God, I pray there'll be one name looking, ah, that's yours. And this whole experience, Father, I pray for that one to find and follow you. And that God, we believe and trust you. That God, the one, not only won't, won't see an amazing per production, they'll see that. They won't see a really fun family experience, but Jesus, we pray they see you. And they see that there, there's treasure in the trouble they've been through. So God, we thank you, God, for the hundreds. Because we, God, we're going to pray it, believe it, and confess it for the hundreds of people. This week, they're going to find and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give God praise in this place today. It's awesome. We're going to see a lot of life transformation this next week. And I, I know we're all super excited and encouraged. And uh, we just can't wait. You know, who enjoyed that message today? Wasn't that a great message? Yeah. And as our prayer partners and uh, our prayer team comes down front, I just want you guys to know that you may be in a season where you're like, I, I'm in that season of trouble right now. I, I'm going through a season of trouble. And in Galatians chapter 6, it says that it's important for us to bear each other's burdens. So don't, don't try to bear that alone. If you're in a season of trouble today, would you just come down front and pray with uh, one of the members of our prayer team? Just let them know what's going on. Like, like you witnessed in uh, Pastor John's uh, illustration, just opening up and, and, and dropping your burden here with our prayer team. So if you're, if you're walking through life today, I just ask you to come down. I'd encourage you to come down and do that. And maybe you've never made the decision to find and follow Jesus. And if that's you today, I would encourage you to come down front and say that prayer with one of our prayer team members down here as well. It's the best decision you could ever make in your entire life. Amen? Amen. For the rest of you, we're going to go. We're excited. We're going to go out with a lot of energy. We're going to go. We're going to hand out some more flyers on the way out. If you're going to get some more. You can stop out on our patio experience. We've got flyers out there if you want to hand them out in your neighborhoods. And pray this week for the one. Amen? Amen. Have a great week, guys. We love you.